1464, uh, it's campaign finance. So this one is a little bit confusing. Um, it gives voucher credits to voters for public financed elections so that you would be able to then donate uh, up to $150, $350 vouchers that you could donate. Start The way it would start would be with legislative races so you could donate to a legislative candidate um, to, to if the candidate qualifies for public funding. Um, so the candidate to qualify for public funding, a candidate would have to receive 75 contributions of $10. So they would essentially have to show that they have a base of support before they can get the public funding. They would also have to um, not accept any money from people over 50% of the maximum donation limit. So if they're allowed to receive $1,000 from each individual, if they want public funding, they can only take 500 from you. They can't take 1,000 from you. Mm -hmm. If they take 501, they don't get public funding. Um, so the, and then the, another important point is how this would be funded, because you know, if they're giving, if you're giving all the voters tax credits to go put into elections, who's paying for it? So we're paying for it, but how are we paying for it? So we would be removing a tax loophole for, for example, in Oregon, uh, when they come up, they can buy things and not pay sales tax by showing that they're uh, an Oregon citizen. So this would remove that tax loophole, and that would be the major funding uh, mechanism for this. So people from Oregon would have to be taxed then? Yep. Oh. Income tax, yep. Or sales tax. Sales tax, yeah. 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 So, a couple of the reasons why someone might want to support this. Um, it addresses lobbyists and the donation limits that lobbyists can donate uh, to people who they may uh, be lobbying in the future. It bars elected and public employees from lobbying for three years after leaving office. Uh, so again, part of this is trying to address the revolving door uh, people in politics and government that go back and lobby and go to the private sector and go and influence government. And another positive aspect of it would be that it encourages voters to play a more hands-on role in elections. Because now you're not just voting, you can actually direct money to a campaign. Can it? Yeah. It's an address legislators who are uh, sitting, going through their session, uh, in charge of energy or in charge of whatever, and then go to work for an energy company and fill uh, the next session of the legisl legislature. In other words, it's not after the fact, it's during the fact. But, right. Uh, uh, Morris does that, and, and uh, what's his name? Ranker. Ranker does that. That's a good question. I actually yeah, don't know. Does anyone know? I, it's a, I know it's a very complicated bill, and there's a lot more to it than what I'm mentioning. Um, it, just, it always was peculiar to me that they were making decisions and heads of committees and so forth on uh, the activities that, uh, you know, for the companies that they, right. No, there is problems. So yeah, so the why not, why are reasons why, why you might not want to vote for it? Um, of course, from the Freedom Foundation's perspective, we already have taxpayer funded elections. They're called public sector unions. Um, that's kind of a joke. <laughs> yes. Do uh, you know who's sponsoring that, that initiative? What who proposed that I don't have that information from me. It probably is in the, is it in the voter's guide? Well, it tells who wrote the statement. Then where do you go to find out who's been doing, making contributions? So one good place would be Ballotopia. Ballotopia. I think that's how it's pronounced. Yeah. And that's a paper, so. Okay. And the PDC, Public Disclosure Commission, you can usually find out uh, pretty good detailed information about where the money's coming from. I'm sorry. PDC, Public Disclosure oh, Commission. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's fundamentally a freedom of speech issue. It is, so I'm, I'm getting to that. So yeah, I'm not taking stances on these. I'm just kind of trying to go over some of it for some of the people who, yeah, you found the website if you want to. Ballopedia? Ballopedia, yeah. Uh, and if you put in the initiatives in there, Washington Initiatives are looking at, it's fantastic. And you go through and it shows you incredibly detailed information about, about them, about the people who have endorsed it, the people who are funding it. Um, it has a lot more information than uh, just the voters guide too. If you send that link to the organization, sure. Yeah, that's that's a very helpful uh, well, this resource. This particular initiative isn't it covering an awful lot of topics? <laughs> it does. 
Well, let me go through a couple of points I have on the why not to vote for it. So, other than the kind of j half joke of we already have taxpayer payer funded elections, uh, it revises the tax laws and it will negatively impact uh, Washington businesses, small businesses, especially Southwest Washington uh, businesses, because you know the people coming over the border. That's just a no-brainer. They know that. Um, in fact, it talks about it in the voters' guide a little bit uh, with the B&O tax and so. How it affects the whole state may vary, but how it's going to affect those businesses is definitely not good. Um, Seattle voted for a similar voucher system, and that comes into effect in 2017. So one of the theories is, why don't we wait to see how things work out in Seattle before we do it statewide and kind of see uh, if it works. So uh, there's also unintended consequences that undermine the initiative's goals. So limiting on um, the contributions to candidates will shift money, um, <coughs> and people will then be able to use that money. Or instead of uh, donating it to the candidates, they will just donate it to PACs and dark money. You'll see a TAC ads go up. So you know they're going to spend the money, and if they can spend the money on the TAC ads, they'll do that. If they can't give it to the candidate, uh, but it's going to get spent. Uh, so really, we, we, that's one of the unintended consequences. Uh, it's also interesting that this initiative is funded by uh, people out of state. And it's millions and millions of dollars have gone into funding in this. $700,000 came from one donor from Massachusetts. Um, and and uh, so it's, it's really interesting when you look at the special interest groups that are doing this and you have to say, well, Clearly, this isn't as innocent as it sounds. Uh, when special interest groups are pumping that kind of money in, it's because they're going to get something out of it. I mean, you know, they're not going to put that kind of money in unless they're getting something in return, uh, some sort of a benefit. And in fact, that's one of the points I was going to make about all of the initiatives is that it looks like pretty much all of the initiatives are funded by clear, very clearly by special interest groups. And you can again see, look that information up and see the huge sums of money coming in from very targeted groups. And in fact, most of the initiatives and the donors and the money, uh, it's all circular. So the people who have created this initiative, the people who are doing this, the people who are endorsing that, they endorse the other guy, and they fund the other guy. And it's like the same group of people and the same money sources that are supporting most of these initiatives and most of the stuff that's going on uh, with this. And they can also pay themselves to run for office with public funds at this point. So when they're running for office, if my wife decided to run for office and she's now leaving, she can't, uh, she's not making money at the coffee stand, she can then reimburse herself out of the campaign funds that at this point the taxpayers would be paying for. So I know that's one thing that got a few people a little bit upset. Yeah. Uh, can you provide more information about that sort of a circular drum of money and, and influence and so forth that's going around. That, that's very, very interesting to me. Yeah. Well, I wish I'd put more details on there, but I, I, I know you can look up the endorsements and if you kind of click on them, you can see that. Uh, last night I was doing a little research on that on because I was looking at uh, 1501 and some of the people that they said endorsed it, as well as the firearms one, and they said, you know, the police support this, and I looked up <laughs> the, the sheriff that they gave me as an example, and of course, you know, he was funded by the union that's supporting the issue, and then, you know, and you can just follow the line of the funding of these people. They financed each other's elections and then endorsed each other's initiatives. Yeah, I don't know that I'm familiar enough with who the people are. And I can uh, I can definitely put some information it's together. For education for yeah. groups like ours, sure. that's a very powerful argument if uh, you can develop it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Again, I didn't think to, to start cr checking that stuff until last night at probably 1 in the morning. So <laughs> it was pretty late. It was like a last second kind of going to sleep. And I started kind of crossing the dots and going, wow, I saw that over here too. Wait, no, I saw that over there. Um, and and, and it, they all, a lot of them fit into the Freedom Foundation and, and what we've been dealing with, where we get uh, these groups coming on board attacking us. And then uh, a group of 30 senators all wrote this uh, statement attacking the Freedom Foundation and uh, submitted that and we looked at it and sure enough, you know, they were all funded by the unions and we're going, well, of course you're upset with what we're doing, you know. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it makes sense, but, they're, but they, are, they are connected. And, There's a comment here yeah. in this thing about the effect of the proposed measure on the 
1464 is the public financing of the, of the election. Yes. Registered voters and certain other eligible Washington residents. That's so that the phrase that can make donations using public funds. There are there certain other eligible Washington residents. I did some research on that. I couldn't. I didn't find that uh, that that was actually true. There is some question in the language, and that's one of your problems with initiatives because they don't go through the legislative process and through the rules committee, and they don't bounce back and forth and get amended over and over. The language is often a little bit shaky. Uh, there's often a lot of things missing, open-ended statements, uh, a lot of room for play, and I think that may be one of the areas where there was concern that people who are not even citizens um, could be participating in our election by donating taxpayer money. Um, but I couldn't find any actual evidence of that other than people concerned that it's a possibility. Well, the next step is if you have a Washington driver's license, you get you know, right. you're part of this package and you can get a license without being a citizen. So Right. Yeah. No, that, that's definitely what the concern was from what I was reading. Um, again, I can't say for sure that that would happen, but it's definitely part of the concern that, again, if it had gone through the legislature and they passed something like this, it would not be open-ended, it would be very clearly stated. So, again, that's one of the problems, like I started off by saying, you know, one of the problems with the initiatives uh, is that it's not going through this process. Um, which, in fact, some of them, they attempted to go through the legislature and failed, and then they, you know, go to the initiative, which we're going to get to another one of those here in just a minute. Um, so, 1433, the minimum wage and benefit requirements. And what I have is not a whole lot different than what's in the voter's guide. Um, the, the cut and dry of this is that on the one side they argue that it will help prevent the spread of disease by mandating sick leave. So if you're giving people, uh, if you're forcing employers to provide sick leave, then people when they get sick won't come to work. I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's a rational argument. Um, and then if low wage workers have more money, they'll spend it, which will benefit the economy. It'll benefit small businesses. Again, I mean, it's, it's an understandable and rational argument. Um, on the other hand, um, there are existing laws already that require you to stay home if you are sick. Uh, it may not stop you, but there are laws that, you, that, prevent, that say you can't go to work if you're sick, especially in the food and beverage uh, business. Um, it will hurt small businesses as well. Uh, they say that it will benefit small businesses. There may be some truth to both of those statements. Um, I know just from our position and having a small business, and I've asked my wife about this several times, I know when the $15 minimum wage was uh, being proposed initially, my wife was very concerned and, uh, you know, she's not incredibly politically active, but she is business savvy and understands, and when that was brought up, she's like, well, I'm going to fire everybody and I'm just going to work full time. She's like, I won't make a profit. I can't, we can't afford this. You know, it's just not going to work. Um, and uh, again, even though those proposals generally were uh, argued to be phased in, although one of them wasn't uh, that, that came out originally. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just, I'm a big mouth. I used to be a politician. No, it's great. So <laughs> no, please jump in. <laughs> um, one of the aspects of this uh, minimum wage that isn't considered is that the folks in this room, the majority of us are senior citizens, many of us are on Social Security. Fixed income, right? Okay, so Social Security, if you're lucky, what goes up 1% or 2% or something like that. Yeah. Okay, if the cost of a, of a meal in a Denny's or a McDonald's or whatever is going to go up substantially, so... The cost that, of a coffee, if you come to visit us, is going to go up. Well, we'd sure like to come visit us. <laughs> but the whole point is yeah. that there's this huge segment of the population that part of the recreation and culture and everything else is to go out occasionally and go to dinner, not going to be able to do it anymore. Right. And that never gets addressed. No, that's true. I rarely hear anyone bring up that, that aspect of the argument. Um, but it is true. And wages will go up. Um, prices will have to go up. Uh, so it's going to have an effect all the way across the board. Um, so another, asp another thought here is similar to Seattle on the last one, how Seattle has done something and we want to see what happens in 2017. So one size fits all idea of a minimum wage. Uh, doesn't actually make a lot of sense, even if it's well intended. Um, for example, over in eastern Washington, 
uh, you're going to be getting paid a much higher uh, wage for your standard of living than if you live in King County, where your standard of living is going to be so much higher that the minimum wage is still going to be below the poverty level if you're living in certain areas. So it just doesn't make any sense. Um, there's variations in labor pricing, and they directly tie to local conditions. So Oregon actually passed uh, regional minimum wage rates. Um, so they're, you know, they've got different minimum wages based on different areas. Um, and it's an interesting idea, and I think that we should see what happens in Oregon as that's being implemented over the next few years. Uh, but I know that we've written about minimum wage in the past, and uh, uh, we're not taking a stance on this initiative, but I know we've written about the minimum wage in the past, and we, we think that it's kind of foolish, too, to just try to say that one size fits all standard everywhere across the board. Uh, again, the idea of doing it if you're going to do something like that, doing it more like how Oregon is, where you're taking into account the cost of living, makes a lot more sense. So, 1491. This is a very controversial one with a lot of people that I know. Uh, it has to do with firearms and what it does, would it would allow family members and people who are dating, roommates, or law enforcement, uh, to ask a judge for an extreme protection order or for an emergency ex parte that removes firearms from an individual who is showing or demonstrating risk of violent behavior uh, or uh, I can't remember what it said, something about mental disorders and that was one of the real big uh, problems that people had with the way that they described mental disorders. Um, so you, you would be allowed a hearing within 14 days to uh, make your claim that you are fit to have a firearm. Um, and if you don't prove that at that time, then you have a year uh, where you lose your firearm rights and then you can again appeal to try and get your firearms back. So the reasons why uh, this is a good idea, in fact, my wife, when I was talking to her about it on the way up here, said, well, gosh, I can definitely see some good reasons for this one. And, and there are some good reasons. Uh, the ideas are to have another tool to save lives. And there was specific examples given when they brought this to the state legislature and tried to get this passed in the state legislature uh, and had a tragic story uh, of a child who was having some different mental issues and uh, ended up shooting his stepsister and himself. And it was a terrible, tragic story, and the uh, mother was in lobbying the legislature trying to get him to pass, uh, pass this bill. Uh, obviously, there was issues with the bill because the bill never even got a vote. They had a hearing on it. It never even was voted on, so uh, it didn't have enough support to even get called to a vote. But the idea is to keep the guns out of hands of mentally disturbed people and, and out of people who may commit harm to themselves or others. Uh, yes? Don't you think that most of the liberals would consider the conservatives in that, in that vote? <laughs> <laughs> so, or libertarians. <laughs> <laughs> so questions about uh, why, why wouldn't you support this bill uh, or this initiative? So there are definitely questions about due process that come out immediately. Um, especially with the ex parte, uh, just put aside the uh, extreme risk protection order, uh, that's the softer one. So for purposes of measuring, that's not really as relevant as the fact that it also gives them this, this other right where uh, someone can simply just come in and say, you know, this person is acting erratic, um, you know, tell, tell the police officer, tell the judge, my fiance or my ex-boyfriend is acting erratic. I know that he has firearms. Uh, he's been drinking a lot lately. We don't know. It's pretty arbitrary. There isn't a very clear what is going to meet the criteria. That sounds bad. We don't know his side of the story at all. But we. But she's sitting there saying he's got guns. He's been acting erratic. Uh, he's been drinking a lot. They could just say, all right, we're sending the police over to his house. They're going to go over to his house and take his guns. I mean, that, that, that could be dangerous, going to take somebody's guns away. Uh, first of all, they haven't threatened anybody. They haven't committed any crime. Uh, so there, there's definite problems with due process. There's also problems with safety for the officers who are being asked to be involved with these things. Domestic violence disputes are the most dangerous things for police officers to respond to. 
Um, you'd have to put this right up there, going and trying to confiscate people's firearms. Um, people who have not even alleged to have committed crimes. Um, it, it would just be a kind of a shaky situation for a lot of people, I'm sure. Uh, again, very well intended, uh, and the goal is to prevent people from hurting themselves. Uh, another reason why maybe not to vote for it is that there are already laws on the books uh, to uh, deal with people who are dangerous, who have firearms, and you, you can call the police and talk to them if you're concerned about someone or if they've threatened someone. Um, and it, I know one of the issues I read in one of the newspapers is uh, how it stigmatizes mental illness with mass shootings. That was something that people really took issue with, saying that, you know, uh, we already have a lot of problems with stigmatizing people who are mentally ill. The fact of the matter is, is that most people who are mentally ill are not uh, violent, and there is a stigma of that, but it's because of things like this that allude to that, uh, when, when the reality is that it's more likely that something bad would happen to them, not that they would do it to somebody else. Uh, but I know that was another problem with the wording of, of the initiative. So I-732 concerns taxes, and the, well, it doesn't concern taxes, it does, but it, it incentive, the goal is to incentivize people to stop using fossil fuel through the carbon tax. And from what I heard earlier, it sounds like several people in this room are pretty well informed on this one already. Um, so feel free to jump in and uh, say whatever you'd like. I'm just going to run through a couple of things. So I know one of the things that it talks about is that it will increase the revenue through a new carbon tax. Um, I spent a little time trying to look into that uh, without tremendous success. I know that some of the numbers are there, but trying to find out how it would directly, uh, specifically affect individuals uh, was not quite as easy to establish. There would be some lost revenue through sales tax reduction, so our sales tax would drop by a percentage point. Uh, there would be some loss of revenue from the B&O taxes and uh, loss of revenue from working families tax exemptions. So why, why would you want to support this? To save the environment and make polluters pay, right? I mean. It says a lot more if you read about it and you look it up, but I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Why would you want to support this? Because you want to save the environment and make polluters pay. Um, I think that's a good summary of, of why you would support it. Why you would not support it, yeah. Sorry to keep interrupting. No, no, you're fine. Well, I don't know if you researched this or not, but the, uh, uh, the rate would start at $15 per metric ton. Mm -hmm. Up to and then, $100. And then it would go up to $100 per metric ton. Yeah. Do you have any way for us to understand what that means? I mean, how, many, how much is a gallon of gas going to go up? How do you relate to that? Does anybody know that? Because that's what I was trying to figure out last night, mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure it out when I was trying to step, because for the same reason, I was trying to think, well, how much is how's that going to affect me uh, in my daily commute? If I, how can I measure that? And it was amazing when I was looking up how much information there is about this proposal and ideas similar to this all around the nation. And, and very little as far as how it would actually affect you. I'm sure that there's studies out there and information out there, but... Is that it? No? Yeah? Well, my question is, how is this going to save the environment? Aren't they putting the money in the general fund? Yeah, so why would you not vote for this? Um, so I chose to just take a couple of quotes from the Progressive Voter's Guide, um, and... Uh, I generally don't agree with a lot of things I see in the Progressive Voters Guide. Uh, but this was very telling because, again, this is an initiative that generally uh, they would be 100% behind. Uh, this would be something that they and Fuse and others would be backing and supporting. And what they said was, I-732 is so poorly written and full of unintended consequences that we cannot support it. It has several major flaws. It would cost more than it would bring in. These tax breaks would cost taxpayers approximately seven point, or $797 million over six years. It fails to invest any carbon tax revenue in clean energy sources. In addition, it fails to limit carbon pollution or to enforce the carbon pollution reductions already required by law. And again, when I looked into it, um, it was amazing to me the number of different environmentalist groups 
that opposed it and different progressive and liberal causes that are generally on the forefront pushing for environmental protection, uh, championing the cause, they are some of the most outspoken people opposing this initiative. So you know, generally you would think that it would be coming from the political right and the Republicans and conservatives would be the most outspoken. In fact, I believe in the voter's guide, the, uh, the statements against this one, I believe most of them are from Democrats and folks on the left. Uh, yeah. Let me know if I'm wrong on that. No, you're right. It's like um, the Washington State Labor Council, One America, Got Green. Um, yeah, so anyway, I, I think that the, the consensus is that it was poorly written and not well done by, by most people who are involved with it. Uh, even the people who uh, completely support the concept and idea and want it. But didn't the governor already put a carbon tax on? Did he just do that? I don't know. Oh. I don't think so. I know it was talked about the last uh, legislative session. Well, I know there's been quite a bit of talk like in the, 